Good morning to everyone. And I also wish to thank Professor Sassoli for the inspiring introduction. Uh, I think it's a great idea to present uh, the three projects together because they do not only address the issue of the protection of the environment um, and uh, armed conflicts from different uh, angles, but they are, to my mind, truly complementary. The ICRC revised guidelines will be a restatement of the rules of international humanitarian law providing protection to the environment. And the Geneva principles uh, focus, as has already been said, specifically on the protection of water resources and water infrastructures. The International Law Commission's topic on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts is the broadest and most general of the three projects, and therefore perhaps uh, a good choice uh, to be introduced first. What I will try to do uh, in the next 20 minutes is not to present to you 28 draft principles, but if you are interested in them, you can find them at the ILC website, and there are some uh, copies also available in the room. What I will try to do is to describe the general approach of the ILC topic, giving also examples of how this general approach uh, is reflected in the draft principles. I will then, time permitting, uh, say a few words uh, of what will happen next for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the ILC process. And let me also clarify that I am the second special rapporteur for the topic since 2017, and I have built on the work uh, that was done by the Commission and by the first special rapporteur, Ms. Uh, Marie Jacobson, between 2013 and 16, including how the topic was initially framed. So after this uh, brief introduction, we can get started. I will go through five general aspects that characterize the topic, uh, the IOC topic on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts. Namely, uh, the temporal approach, the interplay of several areas of international law, the opportunity to profit from the enhanced understanding of the environmental impact of armed conflict, the general applicability of the draft principles to international and non-international armed conflicts, and finally, the normative nature of the principles. I will begin with the temporal approach. As should be clear from the title, from the words in relation to, the topic is not limited uh, to situations of armed conflict, but its purpose is to clarify the international law applicable to the protection of the environment before, during, and after armed conflicts, so as to cover the whole conflict cycle. The chosen temporal approach means that the Commission has been looking at the measures that can be taken to prevent or minimize environmental harm in conflict, including measures to be taken before the conflict breaks out. Likewise, uh, special attention has been paid to the aftermath of armed conflict, which as you know is a critical period from the point of view of building a sustainable peace, but also from the point of view of addressing the harm that may have been caused during conflict. To give you some examples, um, the measures to be taken before the outbreak of an armed conflict include designation of protected zones. Draft principle five provides that states should designate by agreement or otherwise areas of major environmental and cultural importance as protected zones, which uh, are spared from attack during conflict. Um, 
other examples, draft principles 10 and 11 on corporate due diligence and corporate liability, respectively. They refer to corporate activities in areas of armed conflict or in post-conflict uh, situations. But what they address are essentially preventive measures to be taken by states, including legislative measures. Post-armed conflict provisions include, for instance, draft principles of sharing and granting of environmental information. This is draft principle 24. And on post-armed conflict environmental assessments and remedial measures, draft principle 25. The temporal approach, in my view, has provided a very useful frame uh, for the work of the topic and has allowed the Commission to take a fresh look at the different environmental concerns and challenges that arise in relation to armed conflicts. Secondly, the topic is not limited to the law of armed conflicts, but also draws on human rights law, which is applicable during all phases, and international environmental law. The draft principles on corporate due diligence, corporate liability, environmental information I just mentioned uh, are examples of this approach. They build on human rights law and uh, international environmental law. But I would also like to draw your attention to the draft principles applicable to situations of occupation. These are draft principles 20, 21, and 22. Regarding situations of occupation, uh, there was a clear need to look at other areas of international law. Given that the law of occupation was mostly created well before the protection of the environment emerged as a subject of international legal regulation, the main sources being the, uh, to, uh, being the 1907 Hague regulations and uh, 1949 uh, <coughs> the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949. It is also well established that human rights law plays a particularly important role in situations of occupation. The more so, the longer the occupation. The International Court of Justice has notably stated in the armed activities case that respect for the applicable rules of international human rights law is part of the obligations of the occupying state under the Hague regulations. The court has further confirmed that international human rights instruments are applicable uh, in respect of acts uh, done by a state uh, in the exercise of its jurisdiction outside its own territory. And then particularly, particularly in occupied territories. As a rule of thumb, it can be said that the longer an occupation lasts, the more onerous the obligations of the occupying power. As the ICRC says in its commentary to Article 2 of the First Geneva Convention, the, obligation of the obligations of the occupier are commensurate to the length of the occupation. And in the addition to the law of occupation, this applies to other areas of law. On this basis, the Commission agreed that an occupying power has certain environmental obligations, including the obligation to prevent significant harm to the environment of the occupied territory that is likely to prejudice the health and well-being of the population. This is draft pr uh, principle 20. It is to be recalled in this respect that the occupying power is expected to administer the occupied territory for the benefit of the occupied population. The occupying power's general obligation under the Hague regulations to restore and maintain the civil life in the occupied territory has been explained as an obligation to ensure that the population lives as normal a life as possible under the circumstances. 
such an obligation has an obvious connection to the protection of the environment today, given that environmental protection is widely recognized as being to the core functions of a modern state. <coughs> the second draft principle on situations of occupation, uh, draft principle 21, says that the occupying power, to the extent it is permitted to administer and exploit the natural resources of an occupied territory, must do so in a way that ensures the sustainable use of such natural resources and minimizes environmental harm. The Commission agreed in this regard that the established right of usufruct uh, from which uh, draft principle 20 derives has to be interpreted by giving due consideration to the well-established concept of sustainability and this in particular in the context of sustainable use of natural resources. But it's obvious that the 1907 Hague regulations don't mention sustainable use of natural resources <coughs> as such. Uh, the third uh, draft principle on occupation requires that an occupying power exercises due diligence. In other words, uh, takes uh, appropriate and reasonable measures to ensure that activities in the occupied territory do not cause significant uh, transboundary harm to the environment. This is an established principle of international environmental law. The International Court of Justice, in the advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons, confirmed that uh, this principle is customary. And uh, its applicability uh, in situations of occupation has also been well established. <coughs> With this uh, broad frame, the temporal approach and the contribution of other areas of international law than the law of armed conflict, the Commission, I think, has been able to fully benefit from the increased understanding of the environmental impact of armed conflicts. As uh, Professor Sassoli pointed out, uh, the environmental impact of armed conflict is very broad. It includes not only the direct effects, but also the indirect effects. And the example I would like to take is the same example that he took, uh, namely environmental effects of uh, human displacement. Uh, this is draft principle eight. Um, population displacement is a typical consequence of the outbreak of armed conflict and one that may give rise to significant human suffering, as well as environmental damage. A recent study on the protection of the environment during armed conflict notes that massive conflict-induced displacement of civilian populations may have even more destructive effects on the environment than actual combat operations. The environmental impact of displacement is an issue to which the UNHCR, the UN Environment Programme, the International Organization for Migration, the World Bank, and the UN Environmental Assembly, among others, have drawn attention. As the UNHCR <coughs> has pointed out, considerations relating to access to water, the location of refugee camps and settlements, as well as food assistance by relief and development agencies all have a bearing on the environment. For instance, uninformed decisions concerning the siting of a refugee camp in or near fragile or international protected areas may result in irreversible impact on the environment. Areas of high environmental value suffer particularly serious impacts that may be related to the area's biological diversity, its function as a haven for endangered species, 
or for the ecosystem services uh, these provide. What the Commission did uh, with Draft Principle 8 is that in Draft Principle 8 is that it asks states, international organizations, and other relevant actors while provide, providing relief to persons displaced by conflict to take measures to prevent and mitigate environmental degradation of the areas where they are located. The proposed uh, the principle includes also a reference to local and host communities on the understanding that better environmental governance increases resilience for host communities, displaced people, and the environment as such. A fourth general aspect uh, of the topic is that the draft principles have been prepared on the general understanding that they would normally apply to both international and non-international armed conflicts. It is well known that humanitarian treaty law covers international and non-international armed conflicts very differently. <coughs> At the same time, Many rules of customary international humanitarian law apply in both types of conflicts. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in the Tadic case famously declared that, I quote, what is inhumane and consequently proscribed in international wars cannot but be inhumane and inadmissible in civil strife, unquote. Not distinguishing between international and non-international conflicts, or seeking in one way or other to harmonize the legal regimes has been a general trend in the field of the law of armed conflict. <coughs> it is at the same time clear that not all gaps in the legal regime of non-international armed conflicts have been filled by customary law and even the ICRC customary humanitarian law study of 2005 puts forward many rules as being only arguably applicable in non-international conflicts. The ILC position too is somewhat nuanced. Let me first of all say that the claim that the Commission has not distinguished between international and non-international armed conflicts in the context of the topic is valid uh, as far as the whole set of principles is concerned. At a closer look, however, it becomes clear that the Commission has used different terminology in different draft principles. It has referred to states or parties or to international <laughs> organizations or relevant actors, depending on whether the relevant measures are intended to be taken uh, by parties to an international armed conflict, parties to a non-international armed conflict, including uh, non-state armed groups, or by states uh, or actors in the position to do so. Uh, furthermore, in, in the case that a draft principle draws on existing rules of international law, the commentary regularly uh, comments on the applicability of such rule, rules to, non -inter, to international and non-international armed conflicts. And obviously, when speaking of measures to be taken before the conflict breaks out or in a post-conflict situation, it would not make sense to distinguish between uh, IX and NIX. And let me also add that most of the draft principles either relate to post-conflict situations or the time before conflict or are of a general nature. Out of the altogether 28 uh, draft principles, only five specifically relate to conduct of hostilities. The fifth and the last general aspect to be mentioned here concerns the normative nature of the draft principles. Some of the draft principles can be said to reflect existing customary international law, 
This is the case of nearly all draft principles applicable during armed conflict, apart from uh, the prohibition of reprisals, which according to the commentary can be seen as promoting progressive development of international law, which of course is one of the mandates of the Commission. Um, the three draft principles concerning situations of occupation in part four are based on customary international law, and this is also the case of the prohibition of pillage. The Martens Clause, too, uh, is customary nature, of customary nature. The other draft principles, which do not reflect customary international law, they contain recommendations to states and international organizations, as the case may be. They are formulated to encourage states or other actors to address certain problems. Recommend, they recommend certain measures and seek to assist states in that regard. They are based on existing treaties or other uh, authoritative sources or they reflect uh, best practices by states and international organizations and promote the progressive development of law in the relevant areas. The set of draft principles, therefore, consists of provisions of different normative value. The response to the question of which is which is in general evident uh, from how each draft principle has been formulated and is also clarified in the relevant commentaries. And maybe I should clarify at this point, I'm, I'm coming to the end, that now that the draft principles have been adopted in first reading, the Commission still has to adopt the commentaries. And the whole set of draft principles together with commentaries would be available for the first time uh, around mid-August as a part of the Commission's annual report. The advanced copy of the annual report uh, should be available in, in mid-August and will be issued then later in all uh, official UN languages. Um, after the first reading, states have an opportunity to comment on the draft principles in the General Assembly after that, they will have a further opportunity to send in written comments, and written comments may be asked also from, from other, uh, uh, from international organizations and others. <coughs> and then the commission, as uh, Professor Sassoli mentioned, in 2021, will be conducting the second reading, taking into account all the comments that have been received, and that would uh, mean the conclusion of the Commission's work on the topic. On second reading, however, the Commission will also make a recommendation to the General Assembly <coughs> regarding the follow-up. And uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of draft articles, uh, such a recommendation uh, may be that uh, the draft articles are intended to serve as a basis for treaty negotiations. <coughs> this, uh, in practice, never happens with other final forms, other types of final forms, conclusions, guidelines, or principles. So most likely the recommendation in 2021 would consist in uh, saying that the General Assembly should adopt, uh, should take note of the draft principles, attach them in resolution, and bring them to the attention of states. Another opportunity would be a draft declaration but uh, what this would, would be, which uh, way the Commission would take has not yet been discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you.